Welcome to IGPA Toronto Chapter 20. I see some snapping, very good, beatnik's coming back. Uh, tons of announcements to kick off the evening. Uh, let me just jump right into them. So events are coming up. For those of you who are not going to PAX East or GDC, don't worry, Toronto's got you covered. Fun stuff going on. Uh, so Game On 2.0 is this cool video game exhibit that's at the Ontario Science Centre, you can go check that out. They've got uh, tons of old arcade machines, they've got an original Pong, which is pretty amazing, and it's two space work cabinets, and then it goes all the way up and they've got like Dragon's Lair cells on the wall, it's really wild, Ontario Science Centre. Do it, uh, and you only have until September, so make sure you get there quick. Um, <laughs> Long Winter Volume 5 is a musical art film thing of the kind that we do here in Toronto. Uh, they're showcasing five different indie games, including Guacamelee, Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time, Star Sea Pilgrim, and Super Time Force. Woo! Ooh. And uh, from the Games Making Games group, they're, they're, doing, uh, they're showing Long Time Coming, a game of Pointed Conversations, and Seven Sins. So they're showing seven indie games from around town. Check that out. It is on Saturday, this Saturday, March 23rd, 2013. That's this year at the Great Hall on Queen West. Uh, we've also got the Level Up Showcase, so is anybody in the Level Up Showcase this year? Nobody! Alright, <laughs> that means everybody won't do Everyone's got to check it out. So the Level Up Showcase, in case you don't know, is a student show. You know how you do that sort of like graduate post show where everybody shows their stuff off? This is awesome because it's like the, the giga student show, like every school in southern Ontario is, is involved. They've got 12 schools, they're showing 50 games, so if you want to meet the hottest new talent, and you want to recruit some people, it's cool because it's like a one-stop shop. Or if you're worried about what the young people are going to do to your job, you can be up on that too. Check it out. Um, and that's going on on April 3rd at the Design Exchange. We also have the Gaming Career Fair at Ryerson, which I'm not sure is open to the public, but I'm announcing it anyway. That's the next day. <laughs> April 4th, Ryerson Communication Center on 80 Gold Street. We have the Politics of Play Graduate Research Symposium, which is a lot more dry than it probably is going to be. It's going to be fun. That's, uh, again, also this Saturday, March 23rd at Bento Miso. That is free and open to the public. Uh, we have some PAX East and GDC stuff to announce around Toronto. It's very exciting that we have regularly Toronto people who go down to, uh, to PAX East and GDC to speak and to represent. So this year, John Walsh from Fuse Power, Nathan Bell from Capybara Games, Mayor Shepard from MetaNet, uh, and Ken Sato, who's on our panel tonight, and Ka Chris Bukowski, also from, from Capybara, all Toronto people all going down to represent at GDC, so that's very exciting to speak. The Independent Games Festival Awards are also going to be held at GDC, and really excitingly, we have a number of Toronto-made games that are involved in the IGF this year. So we have Block Melee by Drinkbox Studios, which is up for excellence in visual art. Really cool, yeah, sure. <laughs> Lovers in a Dangerous Space Time by Asteroid Base for excellence. Christine Love got an honorable mention in the same category for Analog a Hate Story. The Star Seed Pilgrim by Draken and Ryan Roth is up for an Excellence in Design Award, and they've got two honorable mentions uh, for the Nuovo Award and the Seamus McNally Grand Prize Award. I think they're a favorite to win their award category, so give them a hand for that. Uh, recent game launches, Conjure Graphics has launched Act 2 of Krog for iOS and Android. Um, if I missed anyone, please know that you can hit up IGD Toronto on Twitter or on Facebook and let us know anytime about anything that you'd like us to announce at the beginning of our meeting for next month. Uh, so uh, apologies if I've missed anyone. So, uh, John Arminios, where's John Arminios? Right here. Yeah, stand up. Where, there he is. John Arminios and I uh, put this one together. John is one of your friendly neighborhood community IGDA community members. Woo! Committee members is what I'm trying to say. Um, so is Justin Fox. Stand up. Randy Ornstein over here. And where is Alex? Alex, right there. Stand up so they can see your faces. So, these are the people to talk. If you have any questions, you want to talk to them. Strangely, all of our female committee members are like AWOL tonight. So it's like boys night, which is kind of... Something's going to go wrong. Uh, so, <laughs> tonight, I would like to uh, introduce our, our, our moderator for the panel. Uh, I'm going to read her bio because I haven't memorized it. Noreen. Noreen Rana is a UI designer, an artist, and an illustrator who's been working in the games industry on AAA titles, including FIFA 2012 World Cup, FIFA 11, 12, I guess that's FIFA 12 as well. All the FIFA, all the FIFAs. <laughs> One of the FIFA she's done. The experimental NBA baller beats on the Kinect. 
What is an experimental on the Connect, really? She then spent a year in social mobile game development before de deciding to pursue her own business venture within the games industry. So that's your moderator for tonight. Give a hand to Noreen Rock. Hi, guys. OK, so in case you uh, wandered in behind someone and you have no idea why you're in this room, um, today we're talking about business. Um, specifically, entrepreneurialism and starting up a new business, and, and assuming that's what you guys are all here for, is starting a business in the games industry. So today we have four really awesome studio heads, all based in Toronto and Oakville, um, that will share their experiences in starting up a business and being an entrepreneur and just sort of the trials and tribulations of this kind of scary endeavor that a lot of us kind of dream to do in our lives at some point. So, starting from the left, we've got Ken Cito from Massive Damage. We've got Tom from. Oh. We've got Tom Frenzel from Little Guy Games. Um, Albert Lai from Big Viking Games. And Brian Freeman from Hitra. So just to start off, I'd just like to ask, you know, starting from the left, just a brief introduction to the crowd here of what it is that you guys make and do. Start and, yeah, start. Okay. Hello? Hello? Oh, make sure the mic's oh. on. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're on. <laughs> Hi. Uh, well, my name is Ken Cito. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Massive Damage. We started the company uh, two years ago. Uh, we make massively multiplayer, uh, location-based uh, mobile games. Uh, two games out right now, Please Stay Calm and Shadow Wars. Hello? Hello? Uh, my name is Tom Pintel. I'm the CEO of Little Guy Games. We founded the company in 2009. Uh, we so far have worked on IRS games only, but are looking to change that a little bit and do some PC and console titles as well in the future. Our latest game is called Super Stack Time, and you should totally download it. <laughs> My name is Albert Bly. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Big Viking Games. Um, we're based out of London, Ontario, but we're also opening up an office here in Toronto. Um, also co-founder and former CEO of a company called Contagion, which is a game analytics platform that was funded by Facebook. Uh, that I started about five years ago, and it's the leading analytics platform for social and mobile games. Um, prior to that, I've done a whole bunch of non-game related companies uh, that I've either started, sold, or had to shut down. Um, and we make social and mobile games uh, for iOS, Android, and also Facebook. My name is Brian Freeman. I'm a South African who's living in Canada now and loving it. Great country. People actually send checks here. That's <laughs> and uh, we, uh, many years ago, uh, we started a game called Mouse Hunt. We had a very, very good response to it. It's a game on Facebook, and uh, we are now trying games on uh, mobile games as well. So that's nice. All right, thank you. Um, so just to go right into the thick of it, I think one of the most important things that we can talk about is. Why? Like, why do you want to start a business? Because what it really boils down to is your motivation and the reason, like, why do you want to commit to something in the long term? So this applies to everybody because you all come from very different experiences and different backgrounds. So, um, you know, starting with Ken, what was your, ex you recently, uh, you used to work at Enloop, you're the founder at Enloop, which made mobile apps. Um, so what made you want to break from that and create massive damage? Um, well, we, we actually did make a few games at Enloop, but they weren't really uh, super successful nor very well conceived. Um, but it did give us the, uh, the itch to tack on something a little bit bigger. Um, I've always been a big uh, gamer all my life, so, uh, and particularly fond of RPGs and MMOs. So that's why we created Massive Damage. It seemed like a good name for a massively mobile, uh, massively multiplayer uh, games company. Um, and uh, I think the main reason uh, I, I had to quit a different company was uh, I, I think it's the only way to really succeed is to have this kind of hyper-focus on uh, what you're doing. So 
it's uh, there's a lot of people who say they can do a lot of different things at, at the same time, but I think true success comes from being able to just really, really focus hard on uh, your, your goals. And we wanted to do something big instead of just putting on a whole bunch of little apps and seeing what they do and see which ones stick to the wall. We, uh, we went about creating a business that is sustainable and can um, you know, generate a lot of value for me and my team and grow a company in Toronto. Tom, we'll say a question. Um, why did I start? Yeah, uh, like, so, okay, so for, you actually were president of Capybara Games originally. So what was your reason for breaking up from that to create Little Guy Games? Was, was there a strict motivation that made you want to create a certain type of game or did you just want to create sort of an entity or? Um, that's a good question. I think uh, at Capi uh, there was a, a team of ultra talented sort of creative people and um, I felt like I wanted to start something that uh, would give me a little bit more creative control, I guess. Um, so that was, that was sort of the primary motivation for me uh, to start uh, Little Guy Games. So we hooked up with a friend of mine. Uh, he's our technical director, his name is Bill, and we started with a guy. Initially, this was, we started the company during sort of the, like the advent of the App Store uh, and iOS, and with the hope that you know, the App Store would be sort of this awesome platform that we could experiment with different types of gameplay elements, um, which still is to a certain extent. Um, but I think, it, I, I don't, I guess I don't think it really lived up to our expectation. Um, so yeah, you know, I guess that was the reason. Um, so Albert, you come from a different background. You created several companies up till now, like uh, Big Bike Games. Now you're six. So what made you decide to? Hey, what what made you realize that you wanted to be an entrepreneur firstly? Before I dive into that, I just want to ask a quick question yeah. from the crowd. So, how many people here are developers? Can you just start raising hands? <laughs> wow. And, and artists? Okay, cool. I just wanted to ask because it allows all of us to tailor our, our, our answers maybe a little differently. Um, and actually, how many people within the next, call it like 365 days, are seriously looking at starting a company? That's cool. Wow. Congrats. So, um, uh, yeah, so Big Viking is my sixth company, and it was actually something that I've always wanted to do. I've been a big gamer all my life, and I don't know why it is that it took me six different companies to get around to starting a game company, but I came pretty damn close to my last one, and it was the reason why I started this one. The last one was a company that did analytics. Um, we started off doing Facebook apps, realized very quickly that we sucked at building apps on Facebook, but we were really good at, at building analytics. And uh, subsequent to that, um, we productized our in-house solution, and then a bunch of people came along, invested in the company, including Facebook, and raised a uh, crap ton of money, close to $20 million. Um, I started the company with my best friend from high school in San Francisco, and, uh, and ran that for uh, the better part of four years. Um, and the funny thing was that actually my current co-founder was one of my angel investors, uh, and when I was totally burnt out from that experience, I handed the reins to my, um, my co-founder and took six months off. While I was taking that sabbatical, my co-founder also was on sort of a semi-retirement. And uh, he was uh, just chilling and not you know, doing much, got bored, I got bored of traveling. And um, he gave me a call, um, he lived in London, and I was like, okay, sure, I really haven't spent that much time in London. It's actually a much prettier city than you think it is. Um, my impression of London was very, very different than it is now. Um, and uh, my motivation was because I love games, I always wanted to make games, but um, the biggest thing was that I felt like this is the absolute best time um, that I've ever seen to start a game company. And more importantly, uh, I had the opportunity to travel to pretty much every single tech hot hub, uh, hub hot tech hub in the world, um, including like places like Singapore, India, all parts of, of United States, uh, you know, Taiwan, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Japan, and the coolest thing that I found out was that um, 
there's really two places I would start a company um, today, uh, and specifically a game company. Like, I don't think there's a better type of company to start right now than game companies. And the best place in the world, hands down, I think, truly, is Toronto. And I could have started this company anywhere. Sorry, not Toronto, just anywhere in Ontario, really. Uh, because the tax credits and the talent pool that we have and the cost of living is unbeatable. Like, we are so incredibly blessed to be like in this time, in this space, right now, to have the opportunity to work in games and build game companies. So that's my two cents on like why it is, at least from a strategic standpoint, why I started a games company and why we're doing it here. And um, and mobile is amazing. Like I've always kind of waited for an opportunity to to come along, like the right time and um, opportunity to come along to start a game company. My co-founder, who was an angel investor in my previous company, had started um, a, another game company called Tall Street Games, which created Yovel, which is the first bill game um, that Zynga bought. Um, it was the first MMO um, that was successful, uh, or virtual world that was successful on Facebook, and then he created the whole fish tank genre uh, of games uh, called Fish World uh, on Facebook, and, uh, and he also pioneered just a bunch of really cool free-to-play stuff. I know that's an evil word, but he was really evil. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a crazy evil genius, and I really wanted to work with him because uh, he's not just evil, but he's super funny. Uh, which is a really good combination. So, yeah, that's why I started. Cool. Um, Brian, how did you, why did you want to start to grab it? I know it's a pretty awesome story, though. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to try. So, um, I don't know, I think, I mean, you're sitting here for a reason. You're sitting here because you feel cold or you were homeless on the outside there and you thought it would be a nice place to get a warm drink. <laughs> or, yeah, I just, for me, it was just there was this, there's this, this unanswered question, you know. Um, I grew up, and uh, I'll tell you my story. I grew up, my mother wasn't uh, mother of the year, so I was mothered by arcades, like, a great place to be a, a child. And, uh, um, and I came to Canada, and I think society, I think in general, just kind of puts us in a box, you know. And for me, uh, I was always second place. I, I felt like I was Mr. Second Place. I always came second in everything. and then. I came to Canada and I kind of said, fuck this, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I just felt cool. I felt like I had to do it. I had to try. I had to try and fail on and answer the question or I had to uh, try and succeed and, and see what that was like. And so for me, I came to Canada. I'd worked in the internet uh, business in South Africa. It's a much smaller community. And I saw millions and millions of North Americans who uh, six, seven years ago would spend an absolute fortune online. And I thought, wow, that's an incredible opportunity. And uh, I, was, I decided that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to build products for those consumers. And uh, it seemed natural eventually that we, we started in games. And I'll be honest, uh, initially I was too scared to do it alone. So I found a co-founder who, who did it with me, and that was Joe Loger. And we started a company, and unlike Ken, we did throw shit at the wall, and we saw what stuck, and what stuck has been around for five years, and that's changed my life. So, yeah. Cool. Um, well, you mentioned, you know, you're saying that you're too scared to do it solo. Right now, especially with the indie community, one of the biggest things that's happening is right now is everyone is making these games by themselves. Yeah. But beyond that, they're not sure what to do. Um, so, firstly, one, one question is, how do you go about finding the right people to start something like this? And what should you do before you even convince that person, like, hey, I've got this great idea, let's drop everything in our jobs and whatever to start this great idea? What kind of insight can you get, give on that? Because I guess you've all started with co-founders in your cases. Um, were, they all, were they all personal connections? Or in any case, did you actually meet someone that you never knew before that you started this with? Um, so, Ken. Um, I think, well, I think events like this is probably a pretty good start. Um, one other thing that uh, I kind of lived in the startup world for a little while, just to, to, in terms of the, the, the crowd that I hung out with and the people that uh, advised me. And one of the things that stuck out with me was the, um, there used to be this thing, there's still, there's still some people doing it where they would kind of hide what they're doing until kind of it was too late to help them. <laughs> That's what I call it. So they'd be busy working on something, but they wouldn't show it to anybody, they wouldn't talk to anybody about it, they wouldn't uh, ask for uh, feedback or advice. And I think that's probably the worst thing you can do as an individual uh, designer or developer is to 
believe that your idea is so singularly awesome that somebody will always try to steal it and copy it from you. I think, I think that's probably the wrong approach. I think the best way to find somebody that, um, to get somebody passionate about uh, what you're working on would like to work with you is, is to basically show it off and, and, and um, kind of give your idea away and share it and get people's feedback on it and let them help you make it even better. Uh, and add to your vision. So that's kind of um, that's that's kind of what the, the advice I'm getting in the startup world. Uh, when I started, just doing my own business five years ago, and I think it still applies. And I think it still applies to gaming as well. It, it doesn't serve you well to kind of keep to yourself, and, and, and you know, it gets kind of depressing too. <laughs> um, you know, Tom, you started originally. Captain Mario was a huge group of people. Um, so, coming from that, like, was your connections with what Bill you're saying, was that through that kind of group that you met through the AGDA, or was it beyond that? I know, so Coffee started through the AGDA, but uh, Little Guy Games didn't. We actually, I met Bill at a wedding, and he was this uh, young, sort of crazy programmer dude. Um, and we just decided to work on a project together, so we did this, uh, we did this small, Excuse me. Small project together on iOS, and it went well. We we were compatible, and basically we kind of decided to start a company based on that. So I think it's important to, when you when you start with a group of people when you're starting a new company. I think it's important to um, start with people that you have a lot of things in common with. So for example, if I love casual games, and you really like strategy games like Civ or StarCraft, we're probably not going to get along. And we're probably not going to want to build the same types of games. So I think it's essential that you, you start with this sort of common vision and that you really um, find someone that shares that vision with you. And then the second thing that's, that's important, I think, is to have equal passion levels. So if you're super passionate about the game and about starting a business, and your partner's kind of like, well, it's really a means to an end for me or, or whatever, I think video games are cool, then there may be some <clears throat> discrepancy uh, and that will translate right down into the business. So I think, uh, you know, work ethic, basically try to do a project, a, a test project together before you really, really commit to something. Albert, you've started many companies, how many people have you had to woo, or how many people have you started these companies with, or has it always been with the same, relative, just a relatively same group of people? Um, there's a few that I've had repeat experiences with. Um, I've always found that having a co-founder really does help. I've done it both ways. Um, the thing about co-founders is that you're always going to be up and down, and Ken, Ken has a great blog posting about the stresses of being involved in a startup. And it's, it's a roller coaster ride, and, and you want somebody that can pick you up when you're down. And it sounds really cliche, but I think that is like a universal truth in any startup. Um, and like, like you mentioned about the whole um, having a level of commitment and passion for what you're doing, um, there's a saying around this, uh, the startup community, you, you, can, you, you can either be a pig or a chicken in a, in a, in a company, and uh, at the breakfast table, the chicken is not fully committed. The ham is. So you want to, you want someone that is a pig uh, on your roller coaster ride. Um, and you know if you're looking for, frankly, if you're looking for investment dollars, or even if you're just looking for a, a real co-founder, the 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 willingness of the other party to uh, quit their day jobs along with you is one of the strongest signals that you will you will emanate to a prospective um, financial investor or a prospective um, any sort of time commitment or investor of, of time. Um, so I think it's really important that you know, whenever you're looking for a co-founder that, that they have that same level of commitment, um, but also that they're complementary in terms of the skills that they, they, they bring you. Fortunately for most of you out there, I think um, the, the technical people in the room have a distinct advantage because there are, quite frankly, I think, um, uh, a lack of, of great um, technology people in the game industry versus all the other one, all the other categories of, um, of co-founders. It seems like 
um, the, the technical co-founders never have, or the technical people that are looking for co-founders never have trouble finding somebody. It's the other people that are, that are having a hard time finding the a right technical co-founder. Because in the early stages, I've always said, and I'm, I'm pseudo-technical, so I'm one of the unwanted ones. But um, I, I think, you know, for those of you that are technical out there, I think you, are, you guys are definitely, you know, already a couple of steps ahead. Brian, did you have the same sort of experience when you found your co-founder with Brad? So, in, I mean, it's almost always going to be someone you love or someone you respect. And someone you love is uh, someone that's a relative or someone that you've known for a long time, a friend in Albert's case. Uh, someone you respect is someone that you uh, see at work who does an amazing job and you think that guy is amazing or that girl is amazing. And, uh, and then I think the most important thing is someone that you trust because uh, without that I think uh, it's a house of cards. Um, yeah, for me it was a guy I worked with. Uh, the minute he, the day he joined, uh, honestly my heart leapt, uh, not in a, a gay crush kind of way, but <laughs> I, I just knew that there was something special about the guy. And uh, um, and then I slowly uh, convinced him that we should uh, quit this company together and uh, start a business. Um, so getting into more of the, the official term is bromance. Bromance. bromance <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so getting into more of the nitty gritty. So after Albert asked how many artists and developers here, who here is not a developer or an artist? Like who here is a designer or possibly in some other field? Okay. <laughs> so. Basically, the question is sort of entrepreneurial 101. Um, there's a lot of sort of misconceptions and a lot of misunderstanding about ways to get started, and there's a lot of things that scare people when they decide to start a business, and it kind of overwhelms them. So, firstly, like, what what do you think are really more common fears people have when they start an entrepreneurial startup? Um, basic, for example, you know, the debate over monetization: should we make something that's going to be monetized or not? Um, contracts. Contracts seems to be such a dirty word sometimes. People don't understand, you know, the importance of a contract or how to do them. What What are things that uh, someone can do in the beginning stages to help mitigate a lot of fear and stress that comes from just the very basic um, elements of starting, uh, creating a startup? So maybe you know, for Ryan, for example, how did you go about that with Hitcraft? Like, what did you do once you decided that this was this was going to be it? So I, the first thing I did is I kind of started a business part time. So I worked at night and uh, uh, made sure that we had some money coming. Because honestly, if you're not making any money when you start your business, you, you're already starting off slow out the gate. So I tried to make sure that we had some money coming in. And then outside of choosing the right partner, we both went on a, actually a course, like a small business course. So we kind of uh, did a bit of what, what Ken did, is we really immersed ourselves in kind of a startup culture, just to get an understanding of how deep the shit is that we were getting ourselves into. Um, I think that's a, a pretty concise answer, but that basically sums it up. I think we, we really, immersed ourselves in the startup culture. We did a course that was unbelievable on, on running a, a small business and uh, yeah, and we made sure we had some cash coming in. Yeah. Tom, did you go through any of the same experience when you created Little Guy or were you going in as like a producer straight uh, up? No, we, we uh, secured some funding. I, I think cash flow is very important. Uh, I think when you're independent um, and you know, you're running a business that's larger than two people, let's say, uh, you will you will at some point in your business lifetime face a cash flow issue, maybe multiple times. So I think securing funding or always ensuring that you have money sort of coming in uh, is very important. Um, and then of course, you know, formalizing some sort of a legal structure, whether it's a uh, incorporation or whatever, I think that's that's important as well, having some sort of a, a contract boilerplate ready for uh, prospective employees that you would hire or, or, or contractors, those are just some, some uh, business necessities that you need to figure out right at the back. Right. Um, I know this is sort of like an issue that people always touch on and they're not sure really how to talk about it. For example, Brian, you, you said you were self-funded for a hit grab. Yeah. Um, but you know, for example, little guy, like how, what, what are some <coughs> points you do 
need to procure funding. And for example, if you're a small indie, you may not be going out after a venture capitalist or anything. You're probably going for something, you know, your family or Kickstarter. But say you have a more bigger ambition and you want to create a startup, like in Albert's case, what what can you do to start kind of initiating the process of looking or getting venture capitalists or maybe bigger investors to to look at you? Well, I can or, speak to a little bit about yeah. uh, raising angel and uh, getting into an incubator or accelerator. Um, so that's what we do with Massive Damage. We uh, actually spent six months in Montreal um, playing around with board games, trying to come up with game concepts that we thought could succeed. Um, I think there are two main reasons we were able to do that. Um, so not everybody may be in the same situation. Um, what a lot of the incubators uh, and startup accelerators are looking for uh, when they when uh, people approach them for a little bit of funding, even for that 50k over X number of months, uh, they're still looking for people with relevant experience in the industry that they're trying to build something towards. Uh, so that's one thing. If you worked at a game studio before, uh, that helps a lot rather than just saying I just walked out of my father's basement and I want to I want some money. Um, so that's so that there that's the reason why you might want to work for a startup or. Uh, another uh, games company for a little while to build up that credibility, uh, and then you can jump out and, and, and say, "Hey, I made you know, Need for Speed or whatever, and uh, give me some money." And that comes across a lot better. Um, the reason we were able to secure some funding uh, for our crazy location-based game was because um, I had started a previous company, uh, Endloop. Uh, we ran that for two years, and we had some minor successes with some games and some apps. And that was enough to push us over into the, uh, the accepted, uh, I guess, line for uh, getting some funding. So those are two things. Basically, either you've done something yourself that's reasonably successful and proven you can, uh, you can pull something off, you can actually deliver, uh, or you've worked in a relevant, uh, uh, you know, a well-aligned company to exactly what you're trying to build. So if you worked on MMOs and you're trying to build an MMO, it makes sense for everybody involved to. Uh, maybe help you get started. I want to add to that too, and, and, and I'm not saying this because we're hiring aggressively, <laughs> but I think, I think I think that it, it a lot of investors like to see relevant experience, specifically um, experience in a small um, startup that has gone through a lot of growth. Because um, when you're at a startup, it's very very different. You learn you learn things that you wouldn't typically learn at a larger studio, like. A AAA, Ubisoft's Pet Studio. If you were to, to to be in the ground floor, let's say, be you know one of the, the first uh, 10, 20, 50 employees of a fast-growing startup, you'll experience um, so much more that can help you in starting your own company than than pretty much any other experience you have, um, short of starting your own. And and that. Um, that kind of experience helps a lot when you're speaking to prospective <coughs> investors that want to know that you've got you've gone through that uh, hyper growth um, uh, process that you've seen the mistakes uh, being made by by the company and and also you know the things that that went right that you would want to repeat um, and personally that I've I've seen that um, in my own companies because. In each consecutive company that I start, I typically make brand new mistakes, which is absolutely what investors want to see. They they want to see that you know you've you've kind of seen all the bad things that could or have happened and and know how to avoid them. So a great way to get started is just to join a startup. Uh, yeah, totally agree. I think um, what also happens is you end up wearing quite a lot of hats at any one time, so you come up really well-rounded. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna also echo <laughs> one other thing about what Ken said. There's there's also an enormous number of um, incubators that have just cropped up, and more specifically, game-oriented incubators. Um, so, you know, they're, they're easy to Google. Um, there's, uh, there's actually a, a lot of activity happening right now in, in Montreal, if you're willing to make the trip out there. Um, so yeah, this is a fantastic time to, to start because of the, all these new incubators are cropping up. So now we've talked about we've talked about motivations. You know, how do you find the right people? Um, where to get funding, or how should I break into this? So you know, maybe Tommy can answer this. Um, 
how do you go about with your first idea and more specifically, you know, talking about like sort of figuring out your target, what is your target, what is your audience, and what do you do to go about knowing which one you should target is it based, and I mean there's different motivations for different targets, but for a startup, you know, how important is it to know what that is, do you start very niche or do you start for mass market? I mean, that's a really good question, and I think it's largely dependent on, on the group of people that are getting together. Um, I think that you can certainly approach it from the niche way. I, I think I, I really, you know, I have this kind of romantic view on video games that um, it's an art form and you should really work on stuff that you feel passionate about and you shouldn't be reiterating and rehashing other people's crap, basically. So, and I, and I feel a lot of uh, young people sort of up and coming in the video game industry um, are sort of marketing driven, almost. Um, and, you know, we've done that even at, at LGG and we weren't very successful at it. And I think really, if you start with an idea that you're really passionate about and it's something new and you don't really care about the money as much as you care about realizing that idea, I, I think that's sort of like the perfect mix to start. Uh, and you know, I mean, I don't know if there's any studies on that or anything like that, so this is just a matter of personal sort of opinion. But I think uh, the question that you ask me is, is purely a, a cultural thing, whether you, you know, that the culture of the, of the group of people is such that they want to explore uh, something that comes out of passion or whether they want to set up strictly a, a business venture that's going to generate a ton of money. Okay. And both ways of going about it are valid. It's just that I, I prefer the first one. Right. So. Uh, I don't know, Albert, if you, maybe you want to talk about the other side of that, because I know you... The, the evil right. side. I never said anything. It's I was going to say, you were focusing on the technological side of that, yeah. because I know you push HTML5 and breaking the boundaries of new technologies on browsers and mobile. So how do you go about targeting, knowing which audience you want to target? Because even in that, there are specific groups that you can't always cater to just tech based on that alone. Yeah, I, I think in starting your company, there's there's different ways to look at it. You can look at it from obviously the very creative way, which is you know have a creative vision, um, or you can look at it from a slightly more technological way, which I think you know, which is where you guys started. Can um, you guys look at location as this new dimension for? Providing interesting experiences when you guys start massive damage, um, for and, and that's really important if you're looking for funding. You, you want you you want to have some something unique, a story around something unique that you want to to present to the world that is um, ideally rides on some new technological change in the industry that will open up opportunities that wasn't possible before. Um, and and in our case, um, we're we're at the very far extreme where. One of our um, core values slash um, thesis in the business was we thought that HTML5 would be a, a very disruptive way of um, delivering and distributing games in the future on mobile devices. Uh, in spite of what everyone says that um, that range is from you know it's not mature enough or it's never going to go anywhere. Um, we spent the better part of the last year proving uh, many of those things wrong, um, or beliefs wrong, and um, we managed to, to build um, a, a, a fairly powerful engine to have uh, fairly native feeling games uh, in HTML5 on uh, low power mobile devices. So um, our perspective was, hey, like let's let's figure out like how how can we um, harness the changes that are going to come down the industry over the next two to three years uh, from a technology perspective and, and build out uh, a, a core IP that is maybe a little bit different than what some of you are thinking about. Our, our core IP is in the technology. Uh, that, that is our primary focus. Having said that, we can't build a lot of value um, without proving that the technology works and people can have fun with it, which is why we build games on top of them. But, but I mean, the idea is that, I guess what I'm trying to convey is that you don't necessarily have to look at um, your game just from a creative standpoint, you can look at it from a um, strategic uh, and, and or technology standpoint and see where the opportunities are. Um, 
That actually just reminded me of something I forgot to ask all of you. So, uh, Sir James Dyson, the guy who invented the Dyson vacuum, he um, recently had made a statement about you know, uh, the growing games industry in, in Europe. But his statement was that there are not enough engineers focusing on proven technologies. Um, so, do you guys see sort of like right now in the games industry, there's it, it's growing, it's explosive. Everyone has a great idea every day. Um, but do you see kind of a lack of interest in terms of pushing technology more than just creative ideas these days? I, I mean, I think how many of you people grew up wanting to make a vacuum cleaner? <laughs> <laughs> I meant in terms of pushing technology. Uh, most people grew up wanting to make games. I mean, you yeah. speak to young kids, and so uh, I don't know. I just I never dreamed about uh, engineering the, the greatest new wheel or something. <laughs> well, I think with Dyson it's more like uh, kind of making, um, I guess, uh, I'm not screwed up the analogy, I guess, I don't know what the analogy is, but he's, he's making something out of something, so he had, he had vacuum cleaners, so he decided yeah. to make them look like guns. Yeah, which, you know, I guess it's cool. <laughs> he needs to sound more, man, that's what he needs. The way I look at games, though, is it's, if, if one was to look at games in parallel to film, for example, I wouldn't want to be building my, my camera every time I want to make a new film. I'm more interested in, in actually making the film, directing the film, and, and looking for tools in the game that would allow you to actually bring your vision to life. So Unity is a really good example of a, of a technology that's, that's readily available. It's awesome, I'm sure. How many people in this room are using Unity or, or have played with Unity? I expected a lot more, uh, but it's a nice number. But I think that uh, you know the, the whole technology for games. I think that stuff is going to be obsolete in the future. I, I think that it's going to be a lot less, or a lot more frictionless than it is now to actually create these interactive experiences, uh, just like what's what's happening in film. So, and that, and I think that's awesome because as a, as a video game maker, I want to focus on making the games. I don't want to focus on building amazing technological engines. Then I'm a technology company, I'm not a video game company. I think, um, I think it's a bit of both. So I think you build the technology you need to uh, realize your vision. So if your vision requires something that doesn't exist, then you're going to have to build it. And then you might as well be building the best version of that that you can possibly do so that you can leverage it later, you can sell it, you can do whatever you want with it. But and it's great doing that in Canada because of scientific research and development uh, tax credits. So. Which is better than the OMDC. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. I actually want to add one point to that. So I'm obviously attacking this from a different angle. And one of the things that um, I'm, I, I'm sure most of you do not think about um, on a day to day, -day basis is that um, one of the reasons why uh, building a technology company is interesting from a value generation standpoint for an investor uh, is that. And this is, you know, like this is super anti-indie, but um, uh, but it's it's that building technology creates this concept of um, terminal enterprise value, which is a fancy word for saying at the end of whatever it is that you build, when you die, when you IPO, when you sell the company, the technology can um, is more often more likely to have a higher uh, multiple. Uh, and multiple on, what, what I mean by multiple is a multiple on your profits or your revenues. Because the idea is that the technology um, has more lasting value than, than uh, the content itself, uh, oftentimes. Now, I'm not discounting that, you know, if you create the next Mickey Mouse, that's not more valuable than, you know, some random CRM system. But there's this idea that it's, it's uh, if you can build tech, uh, it's reusable, uh, it's something that can multiply the value of an acquirer um, by, by being a piece of their proprietary advantage. Um, and, and I get what you're saying about Unity. I, I, I think Unity is amazing. One of the reasons why we're big fans of HTML5 is that it's open. We don't like um, being on a closed platform and being at, uh, at the whim of, uh, of uh, someone else's uh, tools. But obviously, it's very, very challenging to build on. But uh, that's that's just our take. Uh, no. I, I, you know, I, I honestly think that. I mean, for us, when it came down to it, we tried to build something fun, and we really we had very inexperienced engineers at the time, and uh, I mean, we had no idea really what we were doing from a technology point of view. 
but uh, we tried to concentrate on something that we thought was fun, and people loved it, and then we were deep shit in, in terms of technology, because too many people loved it, and our servers crashed, and I went gray overnight. But, um, <laughs> Uh, and I think uh, someone I respect very deeply once told me, if you do something you love, the money will come. And it's the same thing with a game. If you build something that's fun, uh, the money will come. It will cross. It old, I mean, old ladies will play it. That's what's happened to us. Young people and young boys in Singapore will play it. You'll, just get a, uh, you'll be surprised by the people that play it. So uh, I would say, uh, you know what's fun. Try and build that. and. Uh, yeah, if you get that right, everything else will fall into place. I just want to add just a little bit to that. Um, I think you can find a better balance. I think I think I always play neutral characters in D and D. Mom is chaotic good. Mom is Marvel evil. Ryan, you might be more neutral good. Um, I think I'm more neutral. I'm very pragmatic, but I actually have a very uh, creative side as well, and I think. I think it's important to, uh, like Tom, to really embrace your creative vision and, and um, have that be your guiding uh, force uh, within the company just to get, because you know, everybody wants to feel like they're working on something really cool, really exciting, really different, really creative. Um, you know, nobody wants to feel like they're not working on something special. And actually, that applies to technology as well. Some people just really enjoy building great technology, and I think that's cool too. But um, while you are using your creative vision to, to kind of drive momentum and passion forward, uh, I think you really do, somebody at the company, it doesn't have to be you specifically, but somebody at the company has to figure out uh, how to make some kind of money so that you can do the next game. It doesn't, you know, it, it's fine to put out a game and, and get people playing it for free and, and everybody thinking you're awesome. But if you are stuck, you know, working at this uh, soulless, uh, uh, soul-sucking job somewhere to do that, that's not really serving you well, and it, it might actually hurt your creativity later. Um, so if you can figure out some way to at least make enough money so you don't go broke and go homeless, so you, at least you still have a computer to make the next game and time to really realize the vision, then I think that's probably the best approach, uh, is that neutral. <laughs> I, want, I want to add to that really quick. So, okay. so there's, uh, I also feel like as you expand beyond the two of you or the three of you and the start and the founding team, there's there's this issue of like actually paying people, right? And like, you know, this is going to sound awfully anti indie as well, but I'm evil. But like, you can't pay well, you can't pay people with passion, right? Like. Passion can, can you keep them with passion? You can keep them with passion, but you can't. You can't. You can keep them around with passion with money, and <laughs> but like you need both. And and the reality is, you know, when you go out and you're starting to look for your first, second, third, fourth employee, um, you can you can give them. Yes, you can give them equity and stock in the company, but stock and equity. And, they may be able to, you know, replace um, toilet paper with, but they can't pay rent with that. Um, especially people that you may want to attract that are incredibly talented, like people that can have um, a job anywhere because they're so awesome, and you want them to be a part of your team. And if your company doesn't make money, you can't. It's very difficult to attract those people without something that is competitive on. The, the cash side. I mean, absolutely, if you have a great creative vision and you have great products that people admire and love, that's great, but if somebody's looking at, you know, a, a six-figure or greater salary um, at, let's say, a Facebook or a Google or, or an EA or some other evil company, um, they, they have to, you know, they have to face the reality that they've got kids and an expensive spouse to support. Um, <laughs> and that they can't just go back home and say, well, kids, I may not be able to pay for rent today, but I have a lot of passion. Um, so it's just, I mean, it's a balance. And I don't want to come across as being super evil because I love games too. And, and I work with a team of incredibly passionate people um, that are passionate about technology and about business and about the art. I just feel like, yeah, you do need that balance, like I said. Um, before I, I go 
a little further into that in the more darker side of the industry. I think one of the important things to talk about is also how all of you, not, it doesn't even involve just social mobile games or just mobile or whatever, but the importance of community and the importance of that in your success. Um, I know, like, so for example, you know, Please Stay Calm is, is very much a community based game, and so is Hit Grab. Um, how has that really leveraged the success of that? How do you stay? How do you stay involved with that community so that they're still engaged and still willing to? You know, I don't want to use it's a buzzword, but you know, keep up the retention, um, but keep them engaged with your game along over so long. Yeah, I, I think with especially MMO type games like ours, um, uh, the, the obvious choice that people make is to keep making more and more content. I think that obviously that's. Uh, you, you do have to keep doing that, but you also have to um, put forth that extra effort to make sure that the stuff you're building is catering to the long-term players. Because we have people that have been playing since we launched, you know, in uh, September 2011, and um, they they you know been playing every day. People who have like you know 650 consecutive days played or something crazy like that. So um, the the reason. Uh, you can help keep those kind of players on board is to make sure that they know that they are being heard and that um, you know who they are. Uh, that's a very powerful um, kind of connector uh, where you are, your community moderators and the support staff and uh, even the, uh, the guys at the top like me are, you know, know who the top players are by name, uh, know what kind of people they are and, and um, they appreciate that. Like I'm probably one of the few CEOs that jump into the global chat room. Sounds crazy. Imagine the CEO of Blizzard jumping into WoW uh, general chat. This sounds insane, but uh, so far I can still do it. Uh, I don't know. Maybe once we're 500 people, we won't be able to do it anymore. But hopefully, I can. I still can. And uh, and it's not a complete shit show. So uh, it works. Uh, they. They see that I'm there and that I, uh, I know who they are. Uh, I give them, you know, emoji fist bumps, things like that. It's, it's uh, and I enjoy it. Um, I think that adds a lot to the, the community that they know that, you know, we are taking their feedback seriously. That I'm, you know, willing to put my uh, uh, my face into a global chat room and talk to them about it. Because I know with a lot of free to play games, like a lot of people will dispel free to play, but I mean, there is a lot of good that does come out of it. And I know, for example, you had an interesting a gathering that's based off of them. That was fun. Yeah. It was interesting to hear about it. I, I, we built on uh, Facebook, and Facebook is a social network, so we foolishly thought, well, that means we have to talk to the people who play our game. <laughs> and uh, so we did videos and many stupid things, actually, now that I think about it. But it resonated with people, and they loved it. And we just it felt like we were building it kind of with the audience, not always for them, you know? And uh, we, we still do that to this day. Uh, people actually, strangely enough, uh, meet all over the world once a year on our birthday. Uh, and uh, this year, uh, um, well, they meet in, in London every year. This year I went and it was just bizarre. We had people from all over Europe coming to celebrate the fifth birthday of, of this game. And it, it's just mind blowing. And I think it's just, Really, it's just caring for the people who help you pay the bills, really. And uh, it's much easier to do it on a social network. Uh, and, and that's what we do. Um, you know, Tom, since you know, Super Snack Time is, is it's, uh, it's, it's not like a social game on Facebook or a hub like that. So how, do, how does one, if someone is going to make a product that is not necessarily social, it's like a product, how important is community still in the development of that and keeping it sustainable? Well, um, we've tried various elements uh, of you know social community sort of building with Snack Time. We integrated Facebook um, pretty heavily into it, as well as Twitter. Uh, in my experience, none of these things really matter for the game. We haven't kind of reached the critical mass that I think would be necessary for those things to kind of start to actually play a major factor. So. You know, I don't have, I, I'm, you know, so far we haven't been fortunate enough to have a, a, a mouse hunt type of uh, success yet. So I can't really speak to the power of the social networks and, and we don't, you know, we don't really, 
make games uh, for Facebook. But I think I think if you can garner enough community support for something that something interesting that you're doing, um, you know, there's there's a, like Twitter is a very powerful tool for indies, and I think if you if you are deemed um, an interesting company or your product or a game that you're working on is deemed to be interesting, uh, you may get a lot of support from some of the hardcore indies. Uh, and if you're fortunate enough to get that, then uh, that's going to impact your your sales, your bottom line. So I think there's a there's a way to leverage community no matter who you are, whether you're you know, whether you're building a Facebook game or if you're. An indie. Wouldn't you say something like Game Center is like a yeah, but it sucks. <laughs> it's like, it's useless. Don't quote me on this, please. <laughs> I think Game Center is, is not very good, um, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, but anyway, I, I think Twitter is awesome. If you can find, a, uh, I think like Sorcery did a fantastic job, I thought, with Twitter. Right. And they were very successful at it. And I think you can find a cool way to use Twitter um, of course, you can use it to help promote your game and to get people talking about your game. I, I think that that could be a powerful tool. Facebook, I think, uh, to a lesser extent, just because of how mass marketing and more casual it is. Yeah. But um, I, I want to jump in on one, one thing about um, building for Facebook or actually building for anything that gets delivered in the browser. One of the, the one of the reasons why we built our games in HTML5 is obviously it will run in any, the idea is that it will run on any browser. And um, it also facilitates for this concept in the startup community called the Minimal Viable Product or an MVP. <coughs> and what we, what we try to do is we try to ship out um, our products as quickly as possible um, in, in sort of you know, the, the, the minimum viable product that allows us to test um, the, the reaction of, of players, even if it's a small sample set, and engage in a dialogue with them such that you're able to get an understanding of what people are, 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 are wanting to do um, or um, what they, they don't like about the game that you thought would be cool, um, and also allows you to start gathering uh, uh, more empirical quantitative data um, in, by, by looking at your analytics and being able to, to see, you know, uh, what does like, your engagement look like? What, what does, how does your tutorial funnel look like? Um, all this stuff that, you know, you can iterate against, especially if you're building a, a web-based game, and you can start building a community that way, albeit it'll be a small community at the beginning, but you can still get some fantastic um, feedback early on from, from just a passionate small group of users, and you can, you can basically make them um, your co-developers uh, as you iterate against the game. Um, so you've talked about sort of rapid iteration and you know, fast growth, but you know, for example, there's a lot of you know mainly in the indie space, but you know games that have been built over the course of like four years and then on release have you know been a big hit. But do you think there's still merit in spending time on building a product versus creating a minimal viable product and releasing it out on the market. Like say for example you're creating a game that's not going to be social, it'll be a single product. So you can't necessarily throw it out to the crowd. Like you can introduce your demo and so on and so forth. But do you think there's still merit in sort of a slower paced development process than releasing a product within say six months and then generating fake feedback and metrics to improve on that? I, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the game Idol Worship, and I'm not even sure I'm going to answer the question with this. But uh, these guys were on Facebook, uh, and uh, they, they promoted this game for two years before it was released, and this was going to change the platform. And they had millions of dollars invested, and, and eventually they released a piece of shit. And, it was a beautiful uh, piece of shit. It was a beautiful it was gorgeous, piece of shit, but it was a piece of crap. And, uh, yeah, and I, after that I was like, well, I was like, yeah, what a load of bullshit. <laughs> Two and a half years for this piece of crap. And the, I mean, they used all the analytics tools and they spoke all the right terms. And So I, I think uh, you need to get, you at least need to get to something that's fun very, very quickly. And then if it takes your time to perfect that, then do that. But uh, <coughs> find the fun as quickly as possible. Right. Yeah, like imagine if you had $100 to spend on, on building a game. I, I'd spent at most sixty dollars on getting to V one and getting it shipped, and then the, the, the balance of, of your budget, the forty percent, 
uh, to iterating and uh, on feedback that you're getting on the game. Because they're just, I mean, it makes no sense to not do that if you can do it. Um, and, you know, and this is part of the reason why so many people that come from the AAA industry that go into the social mobile world fail is because they are used to the ship and forget uh, methodology. And I, I know this firsthand because I, I sold um, analytics software to a lot of these AAA studios and they had a really difficult time transitioning to this games as a service model of rapid iteration and you know having more of a data driven uh, uh, development cycle. Okay, um, so touching on to the other side of business, um, like you know Tom you're saying that you, know, you didn't quite have like sort of the instant hit success as like say um, Mouse Hunt did and so on. So what is what are methods one can do to at least sustain yourself? You know, there's talk about you know, contract work and service work. Um, how do you go about finding that, and how do you go about not creating like, a dependency cycle on contract work so you can still create what you want to create? Yeah. So, so I mean, obviously, being around for a while helps. Um, building a network with, you know, going down to conferences. For example, GDC is coming up. Uh, it's an important conference to attend, but just getting down to conferences, meeting people, meeting with publishers, kind of putting your name out there, uh, delivering, having a prior successful delivery um, track record helps a lot, uh, helps to kind of instill confidence in your studio. And I, I think it's an important part of our business right now, uh, just in terms of like being able to use some of the, uh, some of the revenues and channel them towards original IP development and kind of wait for that for that first hit. But I want to kind of speak a little bit about you know the success and stuff. I think it's it's difficult to succeed right off the bat. Um, if you're fortunate enough to do it, that's awesome. Um, it's important not to give up and kind of keep pushing. Uh, and I think it's also very important to recognize what your strengths are and play to those strengths. So for example, for a while we were trying to build Casual Studio uh, within Little Guy Games, but we're all hardcore slash core gamers. And I don't think we understand the casual market very well. Uh, in fact, you know, we don't really play a ton of casual games. Uh, and I think it's very, it's very important to play to your strengths and not try to <coughs> Focus yourself to the things that you're seeing are popular, but rather, you know, kind of like find a niche that find your calling. I would say, yeah. Um, so another question, if anyone wants to answer, is: so what do you do when you come to the reality that your business just may not make it for the next year? Like, what what does one do to prepare? Because you know, there's the exit strategy. What what are common exit strategies one can prepare for if they if, if it just doesn't go well? Because the reality is, many startups do fail. Many don't see the light of day. Um, so, what kind of advice can you give in terms of preparing for the reality of sort of the endeavor that you're getting into? Um, I can start. Yeah. I can start a little bit, and then probably Albert has some more experience in this department. Yeah, um, laid off a lot of people before. So I guess. <laughs> uh, not even just about laying off. I, I think, uh, it, and it comes back to even at the beginning when you start a company is to make sure that you and your partners have very clear, concise paperwork between you to understand uh, what happens when all hell breaks loose and uh, things have to kind of, everybody has to go their own way. Um, and it's not about distrust or, uh, uh, you know, trying to get things, uh, you know, more in your favor. It's more about just removing that from the equation so that there's no question as what actually happens when, when a whole bunch of different bad circumstances occur. Uh, basically any kind of those triggers and you can look at a dog and say, okay, well we, we agreed to do this if that happens, we agreed to do this if this happens. Then there's no argument, there's no drama. It's just, well, we signed this paper and we both said that made sense. And I think that's the kind of important stuff that uh, a lot of people don't quite worry about uh, at the beginning, right? and it's something you can do very simply with uh, startup friendly lawyers who are willing to do it for a uh, relatively low cost. Yeah, you got to plan for failure and plan for success, and I think it's the same thing. It's basically, 
you, you have to look at your co-founder um, as someone, the, the first most important thing is that he's someone you trust. And, but just because you trust them doesn't mean that you shouldn't get paperwork done. Um, having you know, legal contracts with um, your friend that you've known for many, many years <coughs> is not something that is like intrinsically evil or, or mistrusting. Um, it's something that allows you to prepare for failure or for success. So, you know, both companies I'm active in right now, they're both companies where I have co-founders that are friends of mine that I absolutely treat as a family, but at the same time, we spend a lot of time crafting um, the legals, not because we don't trust each other, it's because we want to make sure that we're on the same page so that when things go wrong, um, we, we've agreed ahead of time about how to handle those situations so that you don't uh, have to unfriend them on Facebook when things go wrong. <laughs> um, and also, when things go incredibly right, like, um, you know, at the beginning, there's not a lot of money involved, or there may not be a lot of money involved, it may just be your time and sweat and tears. Um, and, uh, and both uh, co-founders of mine from Contagion and, and Big Viking Games, yes, they're great friends of mine, but they're, they're also my business partners. And when the business does well, um, there's a, there could be a lot of money at stake, and that increases tension. So it's very important that you prepare for success as well. Uh, and, and so those dynamics change. Fortunately for us, um, both companies have done well, and I've remained very good friends with both uh, my co-founders of both companies, and it's because we spelled out all of our expectations in both scenarios when things go right and wrong. And if you don't have a contract, there's always, you know, street fighter matches to resolve any <laughs> conflicts that you might have. Hopefully with less violence. <laughs> um, I don't know if you were just going to add to that? Or I was going to say, I think uh, you, stress is compounded by success. It's, yeah, so, if you you do need to have a clearly defined uh, set of expectations. I, I, I'll give you an example. When me and Joel started up, uh, we took a loan from the bank. We had two employees, and uh, we just didn't have enough money. And the way we looked at it, it was my wife worked, and she was a she earned like eighty grand a year, and his wife worked, and she earned like forty grand a year. And he, we were both paying ourselves forty grand a year that we couldn't pay. So I was like, okay, well, my wife earns eighty, your wife earns forty, you get the forty grand. We both earning and that's kind of how we solved that problem early on and then uh, it was just early on setting contracts in place so that if there's success that you know uh, how you're going to split the money and things like that um, uh, and I can tell you if we didn't have those contracts in place it would have been very stressful because we would have been fighting over money and not fighting to try and make our business better. Um, we've talked about stress a lot I think one thing that's probably important to mention is you know you guys have been through the highs and lows of starting a business, um, or if you want to reflect on just sort of how do you balance that with your life, and how do you go about running a business successfully, but still kind of maintain some semblance of sanity in your lives, like you know, you know, just you know, people say if you want to be indie, give up your social life, but you know, for, can, do you really need to do that? Like, what steps can you do to keep yourself happy while you're building your business and that you're not General, not literally consuming your whole life into it, but or or is in your case is like was that the case? Was there really just business and nothing else? Yeah, the, I think the cost. This is the thing that people don't realize. The cost of uh, building your own business, whether or not it's failure, success, is incredibly stressful. Uh, I'll tell you the one thing I miss about a job is when I'm going home and not thinking about the business anymore. I miss that. So much. There are days I go home and I'm going, oh, I wish I could just stop thinking about the damn business, you know? Uh, so I, I don't have a happy answer for you. Though. I don't. Uh, I don't think there is balance when you're trying hard to succeed, when sometimes you have a cash flow issue and you have to lay people off, when you built a product that's incredibly successful and now you have all these people you have to feed, please when you built a piece of shit and spent an absolute fortune on it and uh, now you have to let someone go because of it. It's just, it never stops. I know uh, you took like a six month break, didn't you? Yeah. So yeah. you can speak about stress. I know Ken it, It's funny, you, we, we, we had change parts and one of the things that you, you brought up was this idea that like even when you're successful, you're still stressed. Um, and it's just as stressful as when, when you're, you're failing. Um, 
I, I would argue that I think that's mostly true, but when you're successful, one of the nice things is that you got you got money, um, and and that that helps a lot. It also it adds a new type of stress, right? There's n different types of stress when you have money, but but it solves some other problems. This is why I like encourage all of you to seriously consider like the money side as well, because it's it's it does alleviate a lot of really bad stress. It does yes, it totally creates new types of stress, and I, I know this from experience because I. I when 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 we were five people at Contagion, um, uh, you know, it was it was really easy. Um, uh, but but it, it was it was easy to manage. But the money was always tight. And when we had fifty, when a hundred people, you know, the, the stress level went way up. But the one thing I knew at the very least is that we had a lot of money in the bank, and I always knew that I could be payable uh, the next month, where I didn't when I first started. So. It's, you're swapping one type of stress for another, I guess, is, is one, one way to look at it. Um, I guess there's not too much else I can add to that other than um, um, find yourself like a, a good partner or co-founder that uh, at the very least you can switch off days when you're binge drinking. Um, <laughs> you know, so like, it, it's good to have somebody who uh, can take over when you're you know, just kind of flipping out and you need to be uh, away for a bit. Um, so that's that's definitely helpful. Um, and I agree with uh, with Albert that uh, you definitely don't want stuff like, uh, like I said, we said the paperwork and and money kind of getting in the way. You want to worry about how to make your, oh, is that not connected? No, you turned it off. <laughs> oh, I mean, you want to turn it off. You don't want to worry about, um, so you want to worry about how to make your game more engaging, how to make your game more fun and uh, and, and more cool, not about you know, whether you're going to eat uh, the next day. So um, yeah, take take the easy, easily solvable stresses off the table if you can. Tom's Tom's a European, so he might have a better answer. <laughs> Now, not, not really. I mean, <laughs> running your own business is super stressful. Uh, having cash flow issues is mega stressful. Uh, I've had, as I'm sure you guys have had, many sleepless nights uh, in the past. You know, ten years that I've been involved in doing my own thing, um, the stress levels have been super high. I think that it's important to kind of uh, have an individual balance in your life. Um, you know eating well and exercising and taking care of your soul and some meditation, you know, that kind of stuff. But yeah. That's all I could add to what's already been said. Yeah, I, I try to stress in other locations, like stressing when I'm diving or when I'm playing squash, or that helps a bit. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, like I, I, uh, the, the first few companies I was involved in, um, it was definitely more stressful because I didn't know what I was getting into. So, well, one things that one of the things I, I learned to do is try to surround myself with um, really uh, experienced or, or smart uh, advisors in areas that I'm not familiar with um, that have been there uh, and and have seen the, the challenges uh, that I'm about to walk into. So they could be, you know, they could be people that are from more of the law or the accounting or operations or HR. Um, I'm always on the lookout for people that. Uh, that can add value that way, um, and and it's difficult to do that if you're not um, active in the community. It's also difficult to do that if you're not um, if you're not creating momentum, um, because that's the other thing about financial success is that it's it's it allows you to to do things like draw like pay for these advisors that that can help solve these problems and alleviate some of the stress. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that helps. I, I have I have an interesting question. Is it more stressful if it's your own money, or is it more stressful if you've raised money and you're spending someone else's money? Wow, that's a good question. So I I bootstrapped it. I've taken angel money. I've taken way too much VC money. Um, I I, would, I I I love the freedom. I love the freedom of like so big biking is completely self funded. You know, we, like we're super lucky. Like, I think you know, we, we grew the company from four to forty-five people in around a year, and and we, I, I think if you guys can do it, don't take them, don't don't take investment. Like, it's it's it's, I, 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 there's there's something about um, 
not having um, uh, to be responsible for someone else's money. I, I actually think it's actually more stressful to take other people's money. Um, and, and fortunately for us, being in Canada, we have so many grant um, opportunities and, and subsidies that it actually is somewhat viable to, to, to bootstrap your way to, to success. So then would you say for anyone who's doing this for the first time, would it be more advisable to try and gain, if you needed funding, look to more personal um, sources versus like going to, you know, to a venture capitalist before, you know, venturing out on that? Because at least say if you take money from your friend, you can buy a beer later. Oh, don't take money from friends. <laughs> yeah. No, your friend this money. Much. She's going to die. <laughs> 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 Government money, you know, like I don't advise taking friends and family money because I think that's almost as bad as taking well, Ken, money. you took uh, friend and family money, didn't you? Uh, no, it's just uh, angels. Okay. okay. Actually, actually, I wanted to counter uh, what uh, a little bit to what Albert was saying. I think I think taking some other people's money is not a terrible thing. Um, uh, and as long as it's smart money, I think, uh, so my experience with uh, Year One Labs, which is the incubator in Montreal that I went through, was very positive. Uh, some of the things that came out of it that are not immediately apparent to you um, until a little bit later on is the network that you walk out of there with, because at least in my experience, um, we ended up uh, basically had, uh, with access to a whole wide range of angel investors and other very successful people in various uh, lines of business. So like the uh, the advisors that uh, Albert was talking about, except we had free access to them, but we didn't have to uh, bribe them. You paid them with equity. Uh, well, <laughs> they paid money for that equity too. But there's also other people who didn't who didn't invest, but I was because I met them through that network, um, I was able to kind of hit them up for advice anytime I needed to. So building up that advisory uh, kind of uh, network is really, really useful because you, you know, you don't know everything. Obviously, you don't know. There's a lot of things about running a business that that uh, comes with discovery, and uh, um, until you have the right questions to ask people, so you have to have the right, you have to have people that you can ask questions of, and you will know what you need to ask until it hits you in the face and then that's when it's great to say oh I think I can call up this person and give them this very specific scenario to the exact situation I'm in now and ask them what what I can do to fix it and that's been very very powerful and that's well worth the uh, the equity that we gave up to get just that little bit of initial funding and the follow-on angel round that we did so that's that's one circumstance where I think it's the network and the advisory uh, uh, power that you get from uh, taking on some uh, investment, so smart money is, is better than... Yeah, I definitely I feel that, um, but what, what I would encourage um, anyone that's looking at building games to do is try to get as far as you reasonably can on your own, because that will allow you to have a lot more leverage when it comes down to negotiating terms with an investor. And when you're looking at taking investment money, don't optimize around valuation or like how much you value your company. Optimize around how much value can this investor bring me? How smart is the money? What kind of access and relationships and knowledge does this money come with? What happens when this person gives me money and they are invested in me and my company? Um, and what kind of advice could, would they be able to give me that I wouldn't even be able to pay for with money um, because they're invested in, in your uh, success. So there's definitely a huge difference between taking you know, um, dumb, what, dumb money, which is basically just you know, anyone off street and someone that has been there, done that, can help you in areas that you're not familiar with. I mean, I think a good example of that is if you're building games as a publisher, they have a vested interest in your game doing very, very well. So they're going to give you the best advice they possibly can. And then more often than not, they don't even want a piece of your company. They just want a piece of the product's success. So um, before the panel, we had taken a poll from uh, IGD members just public to questions that they would want to ask you guys. So um, we've touched a lot on financial issues. But um, one of the other questions that, uh, that was actually quite popular was, you know, maybe starting with you, Tom, or everyone can really answer this if this is the case, but what was one of the biggest mistakes you made in your
your experiences and how did you fix it or what did you learn from it? It's a tough one. I gotta start. <laughs> Make um, no mistakes. <laughs> no, I've made so many. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the biggest one though. Was, um, I think, you know, just when we first started the company and we were building our first game called Battle Blasters, we, I guess, didn't really understand the types of experiences that the iPhone was perfectly suitable for, and we made a game that's, that was fairly complex. Uh, so I think uh, understanding who you're making the game for, understanding the platform that you're making the game on, really trying to uh, have a, a very insightful and in-depth understanding of your demographic is, is, is I think, very key. Uh, and again, uh, reiterating what I said before, which is playing to your strengths. So making a game that you feel super passionate about and then finding the perfect mix of, of platform and distribution strategy and business model that all are sort of organically supporting that vision. I think that's that's key. Albert? Uh, I think across every single company I'm involved in, it all came down to people. Um, the success and the failure company uh, is almost always the people. Um, so there's a general concept around how do you evaluate an opportunity, uh, like a, a startup, any startup, startup, games or, or whatever else. It's, it's the first thing you look for is, is it a good market? Because, you know, um, even if you have the other two things right, if you have a market that's not lucrative or growing, um, it's very difficult to be successful. The second one is people, and the third one is product. Um, ultimately, the product is the, the least important because the people um, are the ones that can navigate um, the company and its products to success. And so really, you can't, and, and also even the best people, you can have the best people, best team in the world, you're always gonna be too small to be able to change the market. The market's defined by whichever market you happen to be. If you're building for you know, uh, like a Commodore 64, you're probably not gonna be successful even if you have John Carmack on your team. But if you're building for free-to-play mobile, you're much more likely to have success because people want it more likely to invest in that and or it's just easier to monetize on those platforms. But um, at the heart of this is, the biggest mistakes I've made was settling for anyone that wasn't um, the best. And really, the, 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 across every single one of my companies, the one thing that made the biggest difference was um, the right hire and the wrong hires. Um, having that, those, those critical people at the early stages and, and being smart about picking them. I've made some uh, bad hires. I fortunately made, have made some really good hires as well that have offset the bad hires. Uh, and when you make a bad hire, uh, acknowledge it uh, and, and face the reality of it and let them go early. Don't, don't make excuses for them. Um, don't, don't think that, well, you know what, maybe it's just because they're adjusting or maybe this or maybe that. Oh, just maybe we'll give them another week. Um, like, hire very carefully and fire very quickly. If the person isn't working out, they will be a cancer. In your team, um, and so I would say the biggest mistake that I ever made was bringing on the wrong people, and the, and, and the inverse is true. Um, we we've, we've managed to set the bar very high for ourselves, and we we have very difficult time filling our positions. But it's better to have um, turn away the right people than to have hired the wrong people. Uh, I was going to say for it, I've got a similar answer, but it's more the psychology. Uh, we're uh, I mean. We as human beings are designed to kind of want to please people, you know, your parents from a young age, you look to them, you want to please them. And it's the same thing with running a business. The people you hire and the people that you network with, there's a side of you that wants to please these people and you can make a lot of mistakes doing that. I've signed contracts I shouldn't have signed. I've hired people I shouldn't have signed. I haven't fired people I should have, I should have fired. All because uh, there's this a uh, little boy inside of me sometimes that uh, wants to please someone. And so 
uh, sometimes you just have to do things that go against your nature, you know, and uh, they're tough decisions, but they're in the best interests of your product, your business, and uh, ultimately your success. Um, I'm trying to think of the biggest mistake. Uh, like Tom said, we don't uh, meet so many. I think um, I think if you're not making mistakes all the time, you're probably not trying hard enough to do something different or uh, push yourself. Um, I think when we first launched uh, our, our game, Please Stay Calm, um, we were still in the kind of early days of, of designing the game where uh, everything was kind of driven by instinct and um, our own kind of feedback because we didn't really have the tools to, to get real feedback and data from how the game was being played by the players. And uh, um, we spent a lot of time focusing on the wrong things um, in terms of what we thought made the game better and what we thought would uh, help get people who at least try the game to stay with the game a little longer um, and that's that's time you don't have when you when you just put something out there um, especially if you've done something really special and, and Apple likes it and they think they want to feature it I mean imagine if your game was amazing but there was this one spot in it uh, at the beginning where you're losing 50% or 60 or 70% of the players and you didn't know that all you saw were your download numbers and then two months later, you're like, why haven't we made any money? Like, it's weird. And we had all these downloads, and now we have like 10 people playing. It doesn't make any sense. And I think uh, what we did uh, to correct that somewhat early, actually, within the, I guess, this month and a half in or so, was to really start, um, stop listening to ourselves and start listening to the data. So um, I'm, I'm all on board on, on making sure that the, the, the product and the vision you're, you're building, uh, you still need to understand how people really play that game. So you need to be able to measure uh, if they're actually getting through the tutorial, if they're actually gonna, you know, are they doing what you think they're gonna do? And then most likely, uh, they're actually gonna do some really random shit that you have no idea they could do. Uh, and, um, and you have to kind of adapt to that because if that's right in your, first two minutes of the game, uh, that's going to be very important. You wouldn't want to be featured by Apple and then kind of not succeed after that. That's just really, really un, kind of an unhappy story. Um, so that was our the biggest mistake was we kept kind of navel gazing a little too much, assuming we knew everything and we knew how our players would react to our game because we've been living in it for so long. Um, and you really have to take a step back and and not just ask players well, how they feel about it, but really looking at the data and seeing what they actually do. I think that even regardless if it's a social game or not, it's just the mobile game, the importance of getting it out, getting feedback, and that's why you know, the Toronto community has been so good about with the IGBA and things like Bento Miso and a lot of organizations that just have people together to do that. Um, one of the other questions that came up was, you know, you mentioned, Brian, that you and you had taken a business management course, like a small business management course. Um, for a lot of people who are new to this, or for just artists or developers, you know, what kind of skills or training do you think one should have before they decide to run a business? Like, do you think that do you think taking a course is important, or are there other things that one may need to learn about like, in terms of project management, finances? What can one learn or teach themselves before they decide to? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a, a relatively, relatively tough one to answer because really, ultimately, I think the success or failure of your product is not going to be uh, primarily about how you spend the money, although it could be, but it's going to be more about how good or bad your product is. Um, for, for me, I, I wanted to understand how to run a business financially first. That was important for me, so I try to understand I mean, for me, I thought accounting was just uh, black or red, you know, black or red ink. And there's actually a lot of uh, weird things that go on in accounting that I had to get my head around. So I wanted to understand how to run a business from a financial point of view. Uh, and uh, then uh, we also, we did a little course run by a company actually uh, that was called BizLaunch. It was like a uh, three-month course once a week where 
you just really you delved into the whole process of running a small business and that prepared us very, very well. But uh, the thing that I needed most out of that course was to understand how to set up a business in the beginning, which was important, and then essentially how to manage the financials. Um, so I think everyone's skill set is different. You have to figure out what it is you don't know. And the truth is you're going to learn way more by diving deep into it than you're going to by uh, thinking about it. I was going to say, Albert, did you go through something similar before you started your businesses? Because you started very young. Was that something that just kind of happened and you learned from everything you made? Or was there any? We just kind of made shit up as we went along. Really. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so don't, I mean, I guess my point is don't be discouraged just because you don't, like, you didn't study business in school or whatever. Like, I, I, I dropped out of school and, and had, you know, been very fortunate in my late teens. I've sold a company for a bunch of money. and. Just kept doing it, and, and each time I did it, I learned new stuff. And you know, it's really not rocket science. Um, what, but what's important is that you understand a product and you understand the, the, the customers at the end of the day, and or your players in this case. Yeah. Um, so, one more question um, before we wrap up is: so, I, so you've had six companies, and you can you start two? And this is your first one, right? And Tom's is technically your second. Um, so, one of the questions was, is it better to run like a single, or strive for a single lifelong company, or to be a serial entrepreneur, or really is there an answer to that, because you know, times have changed now, and the likelihood of having a company be sustainable for that long, I mean, what, what are your opinions on that, or do you see yourself as staying long term, or do you see yourself moving on down the road? Um, is, that, is that something that's been on your minds when you created your business? Um, uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, it, we live in a, a society that has changed so much. I mean, you just look at where, uh, how the web has changed in the last 10 years. You know, it's incredible. The world is moving at a fast pace. So I think the concept of building a company that lasts even uh, five years now, to me, just seems like, I mean, it's a whole new era. Uh, it's a whole, almost a whole new generation. So. Uh, when I started, I, I really, to be honest, I didn't have any grand visions of being a millionaire or, or creating something that would last a lifetime. I just knew that I was called to try something on my own. And I thought, worst case scenario, it could take me two years and I'll have the answer that either I suck at it or I got lucky. And uh, I got lucky. Uh, we've had a product that's lasted way longer than I thought. When I first launched, I thought three months people stop playing this game. That's the weird thing about games. People play them for a long time. The life cycle of a game is, I would say, on average, at least a year, and most people think it's a few weeks. Um, and so, um, yeah, we've had one or two opportunities at an exit. It was never attractive. I don't really have a good answer. I'm just going to keep doing it as long as I enjoy doing it. And then one day, if someone offers me more money than I can say no to, I'm going to take it. <laughs> Excuse me, Albert, oh, I was going to ask your opinion because you started another one even after your break. So yeah, so um, uh, my motivation is is more like an addiction to building cool shit, and <laughs> really like like this is my sixth company, and my, my me and my co-founder really didn't have to do this. Like we were, we, we we didn't really have to do something else, but we like we were bored out of our minds when we took our sabbatical slash pseudo retirement and um, like after six I think it was like in this eight month or something like that it was my sixth month and I just had this like burning passion slash itch to want to go and build something cool and I, I just games was something I've always wanted to do. Now as for whether or not you know there's an like there's an exit like if we built this for an exit or we build this uh, for the long haul I I've I've come to believe that you should always optimize for the long haul. Um, because if you're building something that um, you're looking to flip to somebody else, it's very difficult to build um, significant value. And quite frankly, the only reason I think I'm doing games now and not Contagion is because like, when I started Contagion, I actually wanted to, to build something that was business to consumer. Like, we kind of fell into the business to business space in my last company. And now that I've got this opportunity to build games like Big Biking, um, 
I, I, I personally want to, to build it for the long haul. And, and I think, you know, everyone's motivations are different. Um, uh, my, mine are, and, and this may change the way that, hopefully it affects the way that you think about building your, your, your company. But I find that building the product um, it, it, and building the company itself is equally satisfying. There's something awesome about building a team of people that are passionate about the organization and what it creates. And, and I think they're equally cool. Like to, to be able to look around you and see incredibly talented people that you're able to give a livelihood to, that love their work um, and love coming to work is a pretty awesome feeling. And I would argue that, I mean, for me, sometimes that's even better than seeing an amazing product produced because you're changing you know, lives uh, in, in, in your immediate circle. Uh, and and uh, for me, you know, building the organization is really satisfying when, when you see it you know, grow from one, five, fifty, and, and, and beyond. Um, it, it, there's something magical about, about just you know, creating a, an organization that, that, that is beyond you, know, you. And it's like, it's like having a child without having to inseminate. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, if uh, Tom or Ken, if you had any insight on that, or I mean, I know it's really kind of, it's not really an answer to that. I mean, like, it was pretty, pretty well covered, I think, the topic. Um, but I, and I think, I think it's very circumstantial, and, and it depends on. The you know, things change. It's very difficult to plan for, but I agree with Albert that I think you should plan for the long haul. And if you're still loving what you're doing 10 years down the road and things are still awesome, then why not keep doing it? You know, one of the best things that you can build is a, I think is a kind of a lifestyle business. Um, I don't know, I, I think that you should kind of approach it. If, if you're really passionate about it, uh, then build it for the long haul and see what happens. And then if somebody comes along and offers you a sum of money that you can't say no to, then by all means sell it and start something else. It is a middle ground too, right? So like meaning you, you can you can build a non-lifestyle company um, and and sell a minority share to um, another company and be able to reap the rewards that way as well without having to give up the entire company. That is less likely to happen if you have a smaller company, it's much more likely to happen if you have a larger company. So that's just something that's really nice uh, I'll just add something, uh, just a little bit. Uh, mostly, uh, I agree with everything everyone said so far. Um, I think the, the whole idea of, of a company exit is obviously very exciting, but uh, realistically, it's a very small number of companies that actually get to go through that magical unicorn rainbow phase. And I think, Planning for that is not uh, the most optimal use of your time. I think you definitely want to know what happens when you exit, but I think that's not something we need to focus on. I think that's a, that's a good problem to have to kick back and, and think about when it happens. Um, uh, so planning long term is very likely the most, the best use of your time, because uh, that's most likely what end up happening is you have to spend a little bit more time building up a great business, keeping it sustainable, and uh, you know, if you do that well, then you know the more likelihood of that exit coming a little bit further down the line is is, um, is it's a much more likely scenario than, than kind of hoping for a flip. So unfortunately, we are we've got one minute left. So just before Ryan kicks me out, really quickly, if you guys had to give three words to this audience and advice to to go off and start your business, what would it be? And don't say please stay calm. Because <laughs> I can see this. <laughs> Three words. All right. Uh, ship, measure, and iterate. Just do it. Scotty's <laughs> four. <laughs> Join us and learn. Okay. <laughs> wow. I was just going to say it's calling you. Okay, nice. All right, guys, well, thank you for coming out to this, and thank you guys for...